Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, already the last session of today, uh, of this first day of EV charging best practices webinar uh, organized by eLatinL. Um, still, would like to mention that you can uh, register for the sessions of today, tomorrow, uh, which will be more focused on the power quality, uh, with, with some research presentations from different uh, universities from all around the world. Um, and this session, uh, Thijs will be presenting, my colleague uh, from eLat. Um, he is uh, running the eLat and test lab uh, and works here for almost 10 years already. So that's a quite a long time. Um, and Thijs gained a lot of experience with EV charging, uh, charging stations and the electricity grid. Um, and he is now working uh, mainly on uh, focusing on the AC charging uh, testing, mode 3 communication, with also the new 1511.8 uh, uh, DC charging uh, protocols. Uh, which he does uh, in the test lab. Um, so he's involved in all test activities uh, as manager of the electronic test lab. Um, and uh, he will give a nice presentation about the things uh, we learned in the last years of testing EVs at the electronic test lab and share some uh, best practices with you. So uh, I'm really looking forward to the presentation. If you in the meantime have any questions uh, for Thijs, you can ask him using the questions box uh, of the GoToWebinar menu. And then afterwards, so we can forward these questions to Thijs uh, or email them uh, if there are many questions uh, afterwards. So Thijs, for now, the floor is yours. Um, good luck with your presentation. Well, thank you, Tim. Just waiting to be made presenter so I can share my screen. Yes. Okay, and if all is well, you can see my screen now. So, um, uh, as Tim just told, um, I uh, will introduce you into the lessons learned uh, from the ALAT NL test lab. Um, I'll start with a short introduction about the, the test lab itself. Uh, why do we test, and how do we uh, do, how do we test? Um, then some uh, general experiences. Um, after those, I'll dive into the, the best practices. So I'll go into deeper detail about some, uh, well, best practices and learnings we had for smart charging, for power quality emissions, and for power quality immunity. Um, I'm going to end with some final words, and then there's room for questions. First of all, the ALAT NL test lab. So um, our test lab, it's an uh, open test lab for electric vehicles and uh, charging systems. And it's a nice thing, it's free to use because it's paid by the Dutch uh, DSOs. Uh, actually, because of two reasons, uh, we want to make sure that the uh, smart charging works. So in the future, if we need to move the, um, well, the charging demand, like from the evening, when there's an evening peak to the night or to during the day that we need to make sure that this this actually works so the vehicles will um, well listen to this and it won't cause any charging issues and also to learn and advise about uh, power quality about the power quality uh, influence of uh, electric vehicles on the on the grid um, but also to um, learn about the immunity of the vehicles to power quality events on the grid and well, advise the uh, manufacturers of uh, electric vehicles and, and also DC chargers about these uh, these effects and the well, um, how um, their appliances perform. Uh, how we do we do this? Well, we have a lab uh, at ALATNL offices in Arnhem, and we have a grid emulator of 30 kilowatts, so we can create our own electricity grid, uh, clean grid, but also a distorted grid to see our uh, um, uh, um, yeah, um, a vehicle or a DC charger is uh, immune to uh, power quality effects on the grid. Um, and we have uh, measurement devices that can measure up to uh, one mega sample per second. So um, we can see all currents and voltages in high detail. Uh, we can see any, uh, well, any disturbances that occur during uh, charging. Um, and well, so we can give advice on those. Um, this is the current situation. Uh, at the moment, we are planning to uh, move to a new location. And here you see a render. 
Um, and in this new location, we will have a far bigger test lab. We now have a lab of, uh, well, about 12 square meters. And in this new location, we will have this entire hall as, uh, as a test lab. Um, so um, that will greatly expand our uh, possibilities to run tests, especially with DC chargers and things like buses and trucks. Um, because at the moment, um, well, we're, uh, we're quite limited by the size of our lab, and this will solve that problem. So some general experiences. Well, first of all, um, mode three communication as defined in the 68851. Um, uh, it, it already defines some steps um, that can be used for smart charging. So uh, things like pausing a charging session or lowering uh, charging speed. Um, but this standard, it only mentions these steps, but it lacks how they can be used or how they will be used in, in practice, in reality. And that's one of the reasons why we see that a lot of uh, electric vehicles, well, they do um, are able to follow some of these steps. But if you really do test some smart charging scenarios, like they're being used in, in reality, um, then, well, uh, vehicles can fail in, uh, in, in charging. They can uh, uh, stop charging or uh, charging on, uh, on higher speeds than allowed, for instance. Um, secondly, uh, power quality. Um, well, there are no specific power quality standards for electric vehicles, although they are quite unique uh, apparatus. Um, of course, they're mobile. Um, they consume quite a lot of energy and you can actually control them. So um, if a vehicle goes to a charging station with a max of 16 amps, um, then it's a device that consumes 16 amps during the whole charging session. Um, if it has a, going to a smart charging um, uh, charging station, then this charging speed might vary during uh, its, uh, its charging session. And if it goes to a higher speed charging station, like 32 amps, then it can be even higher. Um, so if you look at the limits for um, as defined, for instance, in the two standards uh, shown on the right, um, 61,032 and the 12, um, the vehicle can actually be in one of these uh yeah well, one of these standards um depending on the amount of power it takes in um but well there are different limits set of course so it's a bit unclear about okay well, what kind of power level do you need to test an electric vehicle and shouldn't it just be a separate category that should be uh um well um follow the limits for the whole doing the whole charging range from six amps till it's it's maximum um the same goes for the super harmonics or actually that's even actually even worse because there's not really a standard yet for uh super harmonics so um still working on the on the limits still working on the measurement methods um so um committees are working on these uh um, well, uh, on these standards but they're not there yet um there's also still a lot unknown still about the influence of these uh, super harmonics on the grid so where do you have to put your limits um and how are you going to measure so um and that's also a thing we are contributing to to um well, to research these kind of uh, effects and uh well uh, create knowledge that can be used for uh eventually creating these, these standards uh, and uh finally um there's no obligation to test if a vehicle can smart charge before it enters the market so um a vehicle uh before it can enter the market it, well everything is tested um including the horn and uh, the, the all the lights of course and everything but um how it can actually charge integrate with the electricity grid um yeah that's not not tested yet so um and um well that's a thing that our yeah um our experience is that that should be done because it doesn't always work straight from the start and um that's also why we welcome all the uh um well, the new vehicles to come to the Elatanel test lab where we can test how the vehicle charges and if it uh, charges well also when things like power quality aren't optimal. Um, and 
finally for this slide I was also uh, like to um, um, to emphasize that we also created a document together with uh, Enedis ADF about six recommendations in the, uh, the power quality guideline um, and you can uh, find this uh, presentation later on on our YouTube channel it has been uh, presented earlier this day during this event. So and I'll, I'll dive into the best practices for smart charging. Um, first of all, um, be aware that a transaction can be delayed or paused, and not only for well just a few seconds or something, but this can be for longer periods and multiple times uh, during a transaction. So for instance, um, when you're charging at home and you're using just the, the solar power, you're generating yourself. Um, there are uh, smart charging stations that can do, do this. They, uh, just measure the amount of solar power you're creating uh, and charge your vehicle solely by that power. Um, but well, there's not always enough power, of course. There's a minimum of six amps needed during mode three charging for a vehicle to charge. And as you can see on this, uh, it's actually a, a, a graph of my own uh, solar panels at home. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's a cloudy day, so a lot of fluctuations. Um, so during this, this day, charging would be interrupted for, well, about six, seven times, um, and each time for different periods. And well, I, if I would charge on this solar power only, then I, I would like to uh, also event it, 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 that the vehicle would be full, of course, at the end, uh, not that it stopped after the first pausing. Well, secondly, it goes mostly for public charging stations. Um, these charging stations, they uh, can be used to uh, smart charge by the grid operators or by the electricity company or by the, the TSO, um, for instance, to reduce the, uh, the evening load. So um, your charging might be, uh, you start charging at the start of the evening load, for instance, at five o'clock or something, the charging session might be postponed till after this. So till about seven or eight o'clock in the evening. Um, and this is actually a thing that's actually happening in the Netherlands on quite a lot of stations already. And then at semi-public charging stations, like in the in-parking garages, uh, when multiple vehicles are charging simultaneously, um, while the grid connection in most parking stations uh, is not really uh, like uh, originally planned to host all these uh, vehicles charging at the same time. Um, so um, uh, a lot of cases, uh, time deficient charging is being used, uh, which means that uh, one vehicle is charging for like 15 minutes and then it switches over to the other vehicle and then the previous vehicle gets 15 minutes of charging again. So you get a lot of uh, charging pauses. Um, if vehicle is there for like the whole day, and it will get about, yeah, um, maybe about 16 or even more charging pauses in a row. Um, and well, the driver, of course, wants to return to a fully charged vehicle eventually. So your vehicle shouldn't stop charging after like two or three times. Um, and also remember that there can also be long-term parking, like uh, if you park your vehicle at, a, at an airport um, and then charging might be postponed for like a few days. Um, and in that case also, uh, pay attention to your 12 volt battery in the vehicle, of course. Because on the one hand, you uh, want to keep your charging system active um, to start charging when it's allowed again. Um, on the other hand, um, this also draws power from the 12 volt battery, so you need to have a way to uh, to recharge that too, even though the vehicle is not charging itself. Um, so you might think, well, okay, well. These stations, so they might be there. It will be mostly in, in pilot phase or something, but that's not the case, at least not in the Netherlands anymore. Um, actually, all uh, all uh, charging stations in, in parking garages have some kind of uh, load balancing system. Um, most charging stations uh, in the field are OCP 1.6 charging stations, so um, they are actually certified to also be able to handle smart charging. Um, and also, uh, well, charging stations at home, uh, they get more intelligent. They can do these things like charging on your solar panels or um, keeping an eye on the energy usage in your home itself and uh, 
stopping charge stopping charging when uh, there's too much energy uses already in the home um, and about pausing um, be aware that different methods can be used um, generally uh, the state B1 uh, it's a bit technical but it's a uh, so uh, it's, it's just a nine volt flat line um, you use in the mode three communication is being used to uh, communicate there's a, actually you stop there's to go to 100% PWM um, signals that the vehicle should uh, well, stop charging or at least or pause charging um, but some stations also use different kind of uh, methods they for instance go to state F which is a minus 12 volt state um, or state E with zero fold. Um, well, these states are not preferred, and well, our uh, opinion is that you just uh, just uh, only use this uh, state B1. Uh, but we know from practice uh, that these are being used too. So, um, as a uh, manufacturer, vehicle manufacturer, you should pay attention to those states as well. And that's also uh, um, our um, well, our advice. Um, so there are actually three advices. Uh, on the one hand, keep always keep an eye on the mode three signal for changes in the in the PWM signal. Um, so even if the pause is already going on for a few hours, uh, just just keep an eye on it because it might always start charging again. Um, be aware that this state F is also being used. So uh, and um, make sure that your 12 volt battery always stays. Uh, Oh, it doesn't drain too much during long periods of uh, inactivity of not charging. Um, uh, maybe you can, because while there's in all cases more energy in your 400 volt battery, so you might be able to uh, charge from this full, uh, 400 volt battery if the 12 volt battery gets too uh, too empty. Now, for uh, some more best practices for smart charging, well, on the one hand, you can pause the transaction, but you can also vary the charging speed, of course. Um, and for this, be aware that the charging current communicated by the charging station is actually a maximum. Um, during our tests, we've seen quite a lot of vehicles which uh, um, do get a, tend to take a little bit more current than is actually allowed. Like in this example, uh, six amps is allowed. Uh, it actually takes 6.5 amps. Um, this we mostly see on the lower charging speeds. So when a vehicle charges, at the, this is allowed to charge six amps or seven or eight. Um, in a lot of cases, there's a slight, uh, it's slightly overshooting the amount. Um, but a charging station, um, if it's uh, set very strict, it might actually stop the transaction then immediately because uh, too much power is being taken. Then there's also a limit set to the time the vehicle has to lower the charging speed. So when the charging station, for instance, lowers the charging speed from well 32 to, to 6 amps, so really a high uh, decline, um, the vehicle still has maximum five seconds to respond to get its uh, charging speed on that level. And same when uh, there are some time limits when the uh, the PWM signal stops. So when then the charging station actually says that the uh, charging session should uh, stop or, or pause. Um, so the the vehicle has three seconds to um, reduce the current to zero, and again three seconds to open uh, S2. And here there's also a, a thing that the Charging station operator should uh, stay. Should keep in mind is that the, so the vehicle has six seconds in total um, before the charging station may open its its relay, and we've seen differently. Like uh, this charging station, which just when stopped sending the PWM signal, it also opened up the relay immediately, um, and this actually caused uh, um, charging issues. The the station itself actually also failed after a few attempts, and uh, also the um, the vehicle itself didn't really like it uh, how this happened. So in general, um, our advice is just to uh, make sure all these limits um, are all defined in the 6185-1, um, that all these limits and timings are set correctly in your charging station and in your electric vehicle. So um, you will be interoperable also during smart charging. And 
doing smart charging, doing these current limits, be aware that reactive current is current two, and the charging station itself does not see the difference. Um, it cannot see the difference between active and reactive current. It just measures current, and if it goes over the maximum allowed, then it might stop the transaction. So the total apparent current needs to be below maximum. And like in the example you see now on the right, um, there's actually a vehicle which took um, really a lot of reactive current, uh, six amps allowed, and it actually took 6.7 amps of solely reactive current. Um, and also on the bit higher charging speeds, it was also still uh, um, also more active current too. So the vehicle started to charge there, not only taking in reactive current, but also there the, the total amount of current was higher than was allowed. Um, so be aware of that. Don't just look at your the energy intake of your of your converter, uh, but also look on the standard well the reactive current intake of the um, of the converter even before you're actually really really charging. Um, and this goes during a charging session itself, um, but also when stopping a charging session. Um, so I said you have three seconds to lower your current intake to zero after uh, the PWM signal stops from the charging station. Um, but well, don't just lower the active current to, to zero, but also uh, lower the reactive current to zero. By for instance, uh, opening the, the S2 switch in the, in the vehicle itself to really, um, well, um, take the vehicle off the, off the grid. So um, that's also one of our, uh, one of the uh, uh, points we would like to uh, to give. So open S2, and only reactive current is uh, is drawn. Um, on the other hand, um, we'll measure the apparent current intake and adjust the active current according, accordingly. So just just measure what you take in in total, and uh, adjust the active currents to to always stay below the max that's uh, that's allowed. Um, you can also do that by um, just measuring uh, during development all the different scenarios and um, and deduct the uh, uh, this, this reactive current amount um, during the um, during the uh, uh, when, when when charging in the real world. Um, but as you can see later during the power quality immunity, uh, this won't always work or at least this will be quite complex because there are really a lot of situations. So now I would like to go into the best practices for power quality. Um, well, if, if you followed one of the previous webinars or some of our other webinars in the, in the past, uh, then you know that uh, this AC-DC conversion uh, used uh, for uh, in, in electric vehicles and DC charges can cause uh, super harmonic uh, distortions. So distortions in the range of two till 150 kilohertz. Um, well, this is of course, uh, well, there's no standard yet. So um, there's no, uh, not, a, not a certain limit. You should, uh, you need to, uh, uh, you, you need to stay under to become certified or something, but this can actually be a nuisance to uh, your customer. So uh, a customer can, for instance, complain about uh, audible noise. Um, like this uh, gentleman in the picture right, he actually took uh, um, uh, a, 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 a measurement device to um, measure the sound output of uh, the electric vehicle he had. And you can actually see like a, a high peak in uh, um, on this uh, decibel measurement. And uh, that's really an annoying, uh, annoying sound. Um, and this uh, doesn't, just stop with the electric vehicle itself, but other electronic devices, uh, including other vehicles, can also absorb these uh, these kind of distortions, um, and, and on their part, create more audible noise. So um, they can uh, um, also be influenced by the switching frequencies, by these superharmonic distortions from the AC/DC conversion, and uh, also well um, create this uh, take over this frequency and start well vibrating at this frequency and create sound, um, audible noise. 
Um, there could be, of course, a lots of functionality. If there's a lot of uh, distortion, um, that might mean that the machine just stops working temporarily or that it really gets uh, uh, gets broken because of the distortion. Um, lights might start to uh, flicker. Uh, LED lights, for instance, they might be influenced by the distortion and start to, uh, well, flickering. Um, and of course, again, like a reduced lifespan of actually all kind of electronic equipment. So, and for now, uh, well, there are no limits yet, as said, but um, do device, if you already ask your power converter supplier about their superharmonic emissions uh, and their own immunity, and what our plans are to uh, to limit it further, and uh, especially because while well, these limits will be there in the in the near future, um, and if you don't, and, and and they might already cause issues. So your customers might already experience issues because of these kind of uh, distortions. So, um, and while well, the consumers should be uh, of course on the number one position. Um, and to well, already handle this, you can uh, already invest in the uh, proper filters for in the in the EV charger and the DC charger. So, and that was about uh, some uh, well emissions of power quality uh, distortions, but there's also uh, um, immunity to uh, distortions. And for this, be aware that the voltage quality of the grid that may vary. So um, the grid normally is 230 volts, 50 hertz. Um, but well, this is not always the case. Um, this this might change um, because of uh, a mismatch between uh, um, uh, well the amount of uh, power that's being generated, for instance, and uh, um, and the demand of power in a local grid. Um, and in a normal conditions, it should be between 253 volts and 195.5 volts. Um, but this can, so this can, can differ and um, your vehicle should be able to, uh, and your GC charger, actually all your equipment should be able to work uh, on that. Um, not only when, uh, and a different or important aspect is that it's, um, when your vehicle is charging at multiple phases, um, the voltage levels between those phases might also also differ, and um, well, as you uh, probably know, um, the uh, power you uh, the, the the power you can have to uh, to charge your vehicle is uh, actually the the, uh, the voltage times the, the current, and we've seen that um, some power converters when the voltage drops, they actually try to compensate that by increasing the current they take in, um, even going over the maximum allowed by the by the station. Um, like for instance, uh, this case where you see that we dropped the voltage to 200 volts and the, um, the current steadily increases with each drop of the voltage to go to about 17, uh, 17 amps. Um, it's higher than is allowed, uh, the station might actually stop the charging session in that case. And, and this can even go further, like um, when there's really a, a voltage sag. Um, so um, when there's something like, like something going wrong in the grid, like there's a short circuit or something, and for a short moment of time, the voltage really drops to, well, to, it can even go to zero, but like in this case to, 100 volts. Um, we see vehicles that just well continue on charging and even increase the the current. Um, as you can see in the in the picture, the the current is in the in the lower part of the of the picture. Um, the voltage voltages of the grid are in the in the middle part. So the two normal voltage at 230 volts, uh, one voltage at the, the blue one, so 100 volts then, and the current below. Um, it was actually kept by our uh, grid emulator, so um, the grid emulator couldn't supply more current, um, because otherwise it just would have been a nice sinus graph, but even uh, with a higher total current, it was now at about 45 amps, um, when, well, 16 was allowed, so. It's uh, slightly going over. Um, so, um, some lessons. Um, I'll make sure the power converter power intake is, uh, is based on the current intake and not on the power output. Um, and when a voltage sec occurs, just 
stop charging and uh, wait for the voltage to return to uh, to normal um, to continue on uh, on charging again. Well, then not only the the voltage itself might vary, but also the the frequency of the of the grid. So uh, normally it's 50 hertz, but it might differ. Um, it can be it's, it's allowed according to the EN 5160 standard to be between 52 and 47 hertz. Um, now you might think, well, why why does this fluctuate? Um, well, if there's a higher frequency, there's actually more uh, production than demand. And when there's a lower frequency, there's more demand, energy demand than production at that moment. Um, it should all, should all be stabilized, it should always be around 50 hertz, but well, things can happen, of course, um, which uh, uh, will reduce this or will increase it for a short moment of time. Um, so, um, and, and here the learnings are just, uh, well, make sure your converter is able to charge on these uh, these different frequencies. And then there's a learning and it's still an, an open one. Um, when, because while you sh if the frequency is lower than 47 Hertz, then there is much higher demand than there's production at that moment. So it would be wise to uh, stop charging at that moment to not further uh, increase this grid st instability, uh, cause any uh, more issues, especially when when we're talking about millions of electric vehicles in the in the future, um, but you shouldn't stop all at once because well that might of course create other effects when all these loads suddenly go off the grid. Um, so there's some kind of uh, well standardization or remote control by the TSOs uh, needed by the transition transition system operators who are responsible for the um, the high voltage grid and also the, the grid frequency. Then about power quality immunity, there's uh, also the case that the voltage might not be totally clean. It might contain uh, harmonics. Uh, not just, well, I'm talking before about the super harmonics, but also the, the regular harmonics. Um, and uh, just a short uh, description of what these harmonics actually are. Um, they're multiples of the fundamental frequency um, that are on top of the um, the sinus wave of the voltage itself. So as you can see on the right side, um, the top is just a clean voltage. And then there's a harmonic edit. And you can see that the, uh, sorry, still, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm back. Yeah, excellent. Um, you can see the third harmonic is uh, is added, and this has an influence on the on the voltage. So the voltage, instead of being a nice sinus wave, it gets a bit more flattened out. Um, well, same for the below. There's also the fifth harmonic added, and after that, the seventh harmonic is also added. And you get more and more like a square wave instead of a nice uh, sinus wave. Um, and you should be uh, immune to uh, these kind of uh, distortions. Um, there are some uh, well, uh, immunity levels defined in the IEC 613 standard. Um, and during this, um, um, during these tests, uh, your vehicle, uh, your electric device, because it's more a general standard, it should keep uh, keep working or keep charging in case of a vehicle. Um, but not only that. Because you should also, because well, the um, the vehicle charging speed is still limited by the max that's allowed by the charging station, and also when there's a lot of distortion, harmonic distortion on the grid itself, um, your vehicle still needs to keep the maximum current it takes in below the allowed max. And as you can see, for instance, during this test, uh, um, uh, the red circled uh, on, the, on the red circle the currents the vehicle takes in are shown uh, six amps was allowed and we're already going approaching the seven amps over here um, so taking in too much power and actually it is also uh, made the charging station stop uh, the session uh, during this uh, this test so that's a thing to also keep in uh, keep in mind and also um, your power factor so that's actually the sort of the efficiency, of the, the real charging you're doing when there's uh, uh, when you're when you're charging. 
the real energy you're taking, um, it should also stay above, uh, well, at a reasonable level, so like 0 0.85, but preferably higher. Um, and as you can see in the picture on the on the right side, um, this was a um, vehicle where we uh, did a test where we injected the fifth harmonic uh, on the voltage. So you see this wobbly line on the on the voltage, and below you see the current that the vehicle took in. And the current was actually not following, not really following the uh, fundamental voltage, the 50 hertz anymore, um, but it was actually following this fifth harmonic. So it's going to 250 hertz and well, as you can imagine, this is not good for your um, for the energy intake, and um, so the power factor dropped to zero point three. So this actually means that about thirty percent of the, the the energy you're taking in is actually being used uh, for charging the the vehicle. Um, so you're taking uh, like uh, um, six amps of uh, of current, and you're only using two amps to charge your vehicle. So it will take indefinitely to charge your vehicle when there's uh, some harmonic distortion in the, in the grid itself. So some lessons learned, uh, make sure the power converter you use is certified according to this standard, um, but not only certified, but also make sure that the, uh, the power factor stays, uh, well, uh, on a high level. And again, measure the total apparent current taken in uh, by the vehicle and keep this below the max by changing the active current intake. So um, always make sure that you stay below this, uh, this maximum allowed current by this way. So I would like now to have some final words. Um, it's a small, uh, it's a bit of a summary of uh, what you've seen before. So. Um, Regarding smart charging, just make sure you're prepared for all different scenarios. So delaying, pausing, multiple pauses, long pauses, um, all these kind of uh, things that can happen. Uh, always stay below the uh, allowed maximums, uh, the maximum current, but also the maximum time limits that are being set. And especially during long pauses, make sure your 12 volt battery doesn't uh, doesn't drain. So come up with a way to uh, recharge this 12 volt battery if it gets too low via the 400 volt battery or for, from some other way, maybe even a small solar panel on the roof or something. Um, power quality uh, emissions. Um, well, this is mainly just well, ask your power converter supplier uh, about how they uh, how they pay for perform and what are you going to do to uh, perform uh, maybe better in the future. And well, just prepare for these uh, super harmonic distortion limits and uh, make sure your customer doesn't uh, uh, experience issues with well charging um, because of these kind of uh, emissions. So don't just wait for these limits, but already install things like uh, like proper filters to uh, get these uh, distortions out. And power quality uh, immunity. Um, I'll just make sure the vehicle keeps charging uh, while the grid quality is uh, is within its uh, its limits. It, it might fluctuate, uh, the voltage might fluctuate, the frequencies might fluctuate, there might be a distortion, but while this is all uh, within the allowed limits, then we just make sure you keep uh, keep charging, but always stay below the maximum current that's uh, that's allowed, um, especially of course when the when the grid is uh, is over its uh, its limits and uh, just uh, um, Stay below the max, or just stop charging and wait for wait for better times. And uh, and finally, and I think uh, most importantly, just uh, just test um, how your vehicle or DC charger performs. And uh, as said, um, well, we as a and L, we can uh, we can help with that. And this ends my presentation. So, um, if there are any questions, then uh, please let me know. Okay, thank you, Thijs, for your good presentation. I think you shared a lot of important uh, takeaways. Uh, so I hope this can help other uh, people as well to uh, yeah, make sure the integration of EV will get more smoother in the future as well. Um, yeah, we did receive quite some questions. Um, let's start with the first one uh, from Yil Citaria. Uh, she says, uh, hi Thijs, thank you for sharing this practical knowledge. I have a question uh, on the reactive current. Uh, what could be the reason for such a high value of reactive current? Was there a power factor correction circuit used in the electric vehicle? Yeah. 
I'm unmuted um, again. Um, yeah, we are also not totally sure because while we consider the vehicle to be a black box, we uh, don't really open up the vehicle itself or the charging converter, the, the, the energy converter to see what's uh, what's in there. But um, most vehicles do have some uh, some filters in their uh, uh, in their converter, and um, this will always have uh, um, induction and, and capacitance, of course. So it will also um, will take in some some reactive current. And in most cases, it's not that much. And in some cases, because of the topology of the charger, it's uh, it's way more. Um, and um, yeah, uh, so that 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 differs. And um, we've also seen it the same with DC chargers, by the way, um, where some DC chargers uh, just uh, all the time take in quite a lot of uh, reactive current. Um, I uh, believe even uh, yeah, like uh, 10 amps or something of only uh, reactive uh, reactive current um, when they're in idle mode. Um, so this is uh, a thing we've seen before. But as I said, we consider all these devices to be uh, black boxes. We just uh, as as grid operators, we just look at the uh, influence they have on the grid and uh, if that's within limits or if it should be before, uh, uh, should be improved. Okay, yes, so this is definitely something to look into further and also to take into account when testing electric vehicles. Um, another question is from Sayan. Uh, what is your view on the potential impact of these EV charging issues, uh, like the phase imbalance and disturbances, on microgrid systems? Yeah, that's an interesting question, because, well, things like the, um, the voltage uh, might be influenced really a much quicker in a microgrid, of course, than uh, um, um, than on a regular grid. The regular grid is, of course, more robust because there's more uh, well, energy, more force behind it. Um, so, indeed, um, I reckon that especially um, if you have a microgrid, where you also have uh, have solar panels um, and your EV charger, of course, it will be. Uh, a more influence, but uh, more influence with each other. Um, for instance, because of superharmonic distortions, it go uh, well. They, they can't go anywhere because there's no grid connection, so um, they just can only be absorbed by these uh, by each other. So um, how will how will that go? Indeed, um, we did some tests pre uh, in the past, actually, and um, at the year's GRC lab in Patton. And they also have a, have a microgrid where we also uh, charge some uh, some vehicles also with uh, um, on 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 their microgrid, and we actually did saw some see some uh, differences when uh, charging on these uh, these microgrids and uh, and charging on the on the real grid, and um, well, actually it did did, did well, more distortion uh, was present in the grid when you were in a microgrid of course because well it, it couldn't go go anywhere so charging issues may occur earlier indeed yeah so especially for future maybe micro it's important to also have standardization on that topic because you won't have a grid connection grid impedance uh, which can absorb part of the emission so that's yeah. certainly an interesting uh, question um, another question I had myself um, because those recommendations are mainly based on public charging and for the car manufacturers themselves. But how can a customer uh, yeah, choose for when they want to have a wall box or a home charger? How can they make sure that this one has a good power quality and is able to charge uh, smart? How can they uh, yeah, see this? Um, yeah, they uh, on the one hand, they can uh, just go for a charging station that is uh, OTP 1.6 certified, because um, one of the um, things that is tested for the certification is the ability of a charging station to uh, to smart charge. Um, this is this is smart charging via a central system. Um, so uh, in some cases, for you as a as a customer, that might be handy that you uh, the central system somewhere is controlling it. Um, but um, you can also see, uh, you can also uh, check if your 
charging station might be able to be integrated with a home energy management system or that it might be able to couple to your smart meter um, and in those cases um, it will get information about the, uh, the power usage in the home uh, at a certain moment and it can use that kind of uh, information directly to uh, change its, uh, its charging speed. Um, so if these functionalities are present um, then you should also be able to uh, to smart charge at home. Um, yeah, just directly from your uh, energy management system or from your smart meter. Okay, very good. Then one final question from Arthur Andruskiewicz. Uh, if he's often take more charging current than the set point, it's like you mentioned in the presentation, or what about using DC chargers who can manage the current input intake and set point? Yeah, that's an uh, interesting question. Um, of course, there's always been the discussion about uh, AC charging or DC charging. It's a bit like uh, Edison and Tesla are uh, alive and kicking again. Um, but um, indeed, um, DC charging would be, um, perhaps it would be better um, controllable. It could be, um, um, as for instance, a grid operator, you can just communicate with the uh, DC charger and make sure that it always stays below the below the limit. Um, but well, eventually the energy conversion needs to be done somewhere. And if you have a DC charger that it just you limit to to six amps, but it also doesn't take into account it also takes in reactive current. Then as a grid operator, you will still have like a device that takes in more power than it's actually allowed at that moment. Um, so not sure if that will change a lot. Um, and, um, and 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 also, well, of course, there's the discussion about where are we going to do this uh, this energy conversion in the in the vehicle itself or in the DC charger. Um, but well, uh, looking at the market in the Netherlands, it's still mostly AC chargers. Um, I don't know how many, but it's uh, at least I know it's uh, about 30% of all. Charging stations at the moment are in the Netherlands, so mostly of those EC chargers, and uh, they are not going to be easily replaced by DC chargers. So EC, AC chargers uh, are there um, and are there to stay. Um, so um, energy conversion will take place in your vehicle. So vehicle needs to uh, be able to uh, to handle that. Okay, very good. So this was the final question. Uh, thank you again for your presentation and for, uh, for your answers. Um, so this was the final presentation of today. Uh, tomorrow we will have the second session of this uh, webinar series uh, focusing more on power quality. We will start at uh, 10 o'clock again with the first presentation from uh, Marvin and Shamista from Inexis, the Dutch uh, large Dutch grid operator. And they will share some uh, best practices as well and some uh, experiences they, ha they have regarding power quality and EV charging. So we're really looking forward to this. And also do not forget to subscribe for the other sessions uh, on this day. So that's it for today. Um, I hope to see you again tomorrow. Have a nice evening.